Now, 60 years ago, hundreds of thousands of people descended on Washington, D.C., demanding racial justice. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed the crowd and said those now iconic words, I have a dream. Thousands gathered at the Lincoln Memorial on Saturday to commemorate the march, but to also continue the fight for equality. New York Times best-selling author Michael Eric Dyson joins Walter Isaacson to discuss the historic event and its legacy. Thank you, Chris John and Michael Eric Dyson. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, my friend. Always great to be here. You know, we're celebrating or commemorating the 60th anniversary now of the March on Washington. Its full name was the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Tell me about the original mission. Well, the original mission, of course, as you just articulated, was to focus energy and national attention on the African-American quest for equal employment and for racial justice in public institutions, and eventually, of course, uh, to procure the vote. Um, the great A. Philip Randolph in the 1940s had met with President Roosevelt and with his compatriot Mary McLeod Bethune to try to force uh, the president to take action. Uh, infamously, perhaps uh, a, an apocryphal moment, but it is alleged to have occurred that the president, looking at Mr. Randolph and looking at Ms. McLeod Bethune, said, look, I believe in everything you're telling me, now go out there and make me do it. In other words, create the particular contagion in the public sphere for the notion of Black justice, for the notion of Black employment, for desegregating uh, the armed services, et cetera, and then I can act. So some 25 odd years later, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., A. Philip Randolph, um, James Farmer, John Lewis were part of uh, the Big Six and uh, Roy Wilkins and Whitney Young from the, from the Urban League. So it was an incredible uh, convocation of leading Black figures to try to put before the nation an argument in behalf of Black freedom and equality. You talk about the six coming together, and of course, it's led initially, as you mentioned, by A. Philip Randolph. Uh, tell us a little bit about him, because he was a great union leader and uh, sort of unsung uh, these days. I mean, first of all, let's start with that stentorian voice, that orator, when he introduces Tink, Martin Luther King, J.R. I mean, just the authority. He could play the voice of God. He was James Earl Jones before James Earl Jones was James Earl Jones. So, but a great leader, a socialist, along with Chandler Owens in the early 1900s, uh, promulgating uh, systemic reform for African-American culture in terms of economic justice, a great union leader, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters uh, was his significant outlet where he organized thousands upon thousands of black men, many of whom had college degrees, but who found better work um, in terms of a sleeping car porter than they could even teach it in terms of wage. So he was a great union organizer. He was a great social activist. He was a great writer. He influenced uh, so many figures, not only Martin Luther King Jr., but the great Bayard Rustin uh, as well, who eventually uh, came to work with Martin Luther King Jr. along with um, Ella Baker. So uh, he was an extraordinarily important leader who should not be forgotten because Martin Luther King Jr. himself said, the reason we're having this march in 1963 is to fulfill the great man's desire in the 1940s. Another unsung hero. People who don't remember much anymore. Dorothy Height, the woman right. involved. Uh, tell me about her and why has she been somewhat forgotten? Well, the first reason she's been forgotten is the horrible patriarchy that uh, continues to cloud even social justice movements. You know, the old saying that Susan Taylor came up with, hurt people, hurt people. Well, oppressed people, oppressed people. <laughs> and the, the irony is, on that great day, the only women who made it to the stage, one of them at least, um, was Josephine Baker, an expat from Paris who came on stage with some children, and the great Mahalia Jackson, uh, the great singer. So the point is that Dorothy Height was forbidden from participating publicly in the organization of the march and being featured as a speaker 
uh, on that great day. But what a great leader. The National Council of Negro Women, We Lift As We Climb, uh, started by the great Mary McLeod Bethune, taken over by, uh, of course, eventually the great uh, Dorothy Height, lived to be in her late 90s. Dorothy Height was an extraordinary woman who was a leader, an activist, um, a spokeswoman for the best interest, not only of African-American women, but of the general push for justice among African-American people. And I guess the third person really involved in getting this march on Washington going was Bayard Rustin. Right. And he, like a Philip Randolph, uh, a socialist. Uh, so it's a march about the economy, not just about civil rights. Right. They saw early on that uh, economic inequality was the predicate for so much of the oppression that African-American people faced. And when Martin Luther King Jr. justly so got credit in his later years for pivoting from civil rights to economic inequality, Bayard Rustin had been on that theme from the very beginning. He was a black gay man, as open as you could be back in those days. This great man was responsible for organizing the March on Washington, a great social justice leader, a man who was a pacifist out of the Quaker tradition, and a man who understood the complicated and nuanced perspective of practical politics. The nonviolent part of that march, the fact that it was nonviolent was what made it so persuasive. Right. Were there, what were the debates, though, beforehand about how much it should emphasize nonviolent means? Yeah, see, this is what happens when you speak to a great historian like Walter Isaacson. Most people don't know that there were tremendous debates behind the scene. First of all, John Lewis, yes, that August politician, that 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 dean of Black American politicians after John Conyers, the conscience of of Congress. Well, he was writing a speech at 23 years old when, like Sherman, marched to the South. We're going to tear through him. Oh, 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 John, you're going to have to calm that down. And the great Eleanor Holmes Norton was assigned the task of helping him rewrite it so he could articulate his revolutionary ideals and his militant conscience, but in a way that would be palatable ultimately uh, to the to the audience watching. Uh, uh, you know, I think one of the great uh, figures in American religious life, some archbishop said, look, I'm not going to participate if John Lewis's speech goes on. So they're arguing behind the scenes. There were snipers placed atop the buildings in Washington, D.C. by the federal government, just in case things got out of hand. And the Negro folk gathered there would be somehow belligerent. None of that was to be concerned about. Martin Luther King Jr. and the other leaders of the civil rights movement were deeply invested in making sure that nonviolence was both a tactic of social change, but also a philosophical approach to life. The only violence we have usually had to worry about are white supremacists and redemptionists who refuse to acknowledge the fundamental humanity of Black people. If you look at that program, for that march. They have a section in the program called A Tribute to Negro Women. Right. And they sort of give a shout out to Rosa Parks, but none of them are allowed to speak. What do they feel about that? I mean, then the women were chomping at the bit, chafing, of course, by the cruel denial of opportunity in a march for justice, that we are being unjust uh, to black women that they must seek their level, that they must stay in their place. And many of those women were women were irate, even uh, Coretta Scott King, who gave King a sense of what women were able to do when she fought with him about her role as a civil and social activist, because Coretta Scott King was far ahead of Martin Luther King Jr. when it came to international issues of social justice and the war in Vietnam and peaceful protests against that. Uh, so Martin Luther King Jr. himself owed a debt to his own wife, but yet these women were denied opportunities. They were bitter in some instances about them. They were rightfully outraged at the limit, but they were such good citizens that they were interested in the broader appeal to issues of justice for African-American people. But make no mistake, those kinds of experiences were the seedbed for the development of the feminist movement that came right upon the heels of the civil rights struggle in the 1960s. Uh, the I Have a Dream riff, uh, 
was something in Jonathan Igg's book, we learned more about it, was said before the March on Washington, King delivers it in Detroit, your right. beloved Detroit. I think also in Birmingham, Alabama, I read, he right. did a version of that speech. Was he really planning to also do it in Washington? And is that the key part of the speech for you? So the point is that he tried it out before. Guess where he heard it? The great Prathia Hall was in a church in Albany, Georgia, praying one night, saying, and I have a dream. And King, like any great Baptist preacher with a great ear, said, now nah, I'm going to use that one day I don't know where. <laughs> so, so the point is, King hears Prathia Hall using it, and then that Black woman's word, and she went on, she was an activist in SNCC, but she went on to become one of the greatest preachers in America and a pastor in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But King hears that from her, snatches that phrase from her, samples that word from her. All right, maybe rips it off from her and then begins to use it. Yes, he used it in Detroit, Michigan. He used it in other places, but he wasn't quite sure. If you look at the written speech, that's not necess something necessarily that King was going to deploy that day. But as you said before, it is true. Martin Luther King Jr. begins that speech reading in a way that his best oratory, as David Haberstam says this, is never when he reads. Five score years ago, the great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Now it's beautiful, the euphony of his voice, the rising tide of his oratory, but that's not King at his best. So yes, he feels at some point that I got to put this paper down and I got a freestyle. I'm John Coltrane. I'm listening to the style of Miles Davis and I'm with my, but I got to, I had to give my own uh, inflection here. So I think at that point, there's no question that King goes off and delivers one of the greatest speeches in American oratorical history because he had practiced it in his soul and in his mind, not quite in that same way. When you listen to Detroit, it's not the same word. They're not the same words. So there's something about the improvisational character of King, but improvisation is built upon thinking ahead about what you might do. You say that the speech begins so famously in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial with him saying five score years ago, just echoing the Gettysburg yes. Address, right. uh, that it was symbolic. But the next sentence, he says, seems to be at the core of the speech in which he says, but a hundred years later, the Negro is still not free. Yes, it's, it was powerful. One hundred years later, the Negro still is not free. Immediately, the manacles have been removed. You talk about the shackles. He said, look, we are marooned on a tiny island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. And he says the revolt will continue in America until the foundations, right? The foundations of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of America until America is free. That's revolutionary. He begins to talk about uh, police brutality. He talks about the marvelous new militancy that is in America. So that speech, even though he was being calm, was quite revolutionary uh, for its time. And yes, he articulated for America the demands of Black people. And then he said this. He, he said, we've got a check, but the check came back return to us, mark insufficient funds. And he says, we have come to the nation's capital to cash a check, reparation. We, we refuse to believe that the great vaults of democracy are empty. That is powerful rhetoric that has application today as we talk about affirmative action and reparations in our own time. But 60 years later, wealth yeah. inequality in America is still as great the difference between wealth and equality of black and white. What does that say to you? It talks about the stunning ability of America to absorb protest and to rearticulate it as the basis of American practice while denying it. In other words, the hypocrisy of America has always been great. Oh yes, we're sorry for what happened. It's horrible, it's terrible. Every now and again, we have episodes of reckoning but more likely, we have the Governor Ron DeSantis's of the world who want to whitewash history. Ron DeSantis isn't the first person. Right after the Civil War, when Lincoln was dead and Johnson was in office and the South was supposed to pay, all of them got pardons. And they were pardoned not for the sin of slavery, 
They were pardoned for taking action against the Union. And all of the great enslavers were forgiven without reckoning with their great sin. So the best route to reconstructing America for those white folk was to erase memory of racial fracture and history. And unfortunately, that has continued to this day. We've denied the systemic basis of inequality. The banks are still messed up when it comes to uh, giving black people loans. The housing crisis underscores the degree to which there is still rampant segregation there. When we look at education, the two-tiered, three-tiered system that assigns people relatively inferior statuses. So when you look across the board, African-American people to continue to struggle as a result of systemic inequities that are deeply entrenched in American political life. And we seem to be seeing a backlash, especially against things that you just said. People sure. being able to say it was systemic or the systemic racism. A uh, backlash that comes a few years after the Black Lives Matter marches. Why are we going through this backlash? And is it something that is like a pendulum? It'll swing back. It will. It takes a lot of hope to believe that because the fracas is so bitter the contestation of those who are the merchants of amnesia is so powerful. As the late, great Gore Vidal said, we live in the United States of amnesia. And uh, that's where we are. We're citizens of the kingdom of amnesia. I'm trying to get us to become citizens, and as you uh, are so brilliantly, trying to get us to become citizens of the kingdom of memory. Um, I think Barbara Streisand supplies the theme song to the amnesiac. What's too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. And so we're forgetting it. Uh, this is why a, a governor in Florida wants to ban books, books about that history that would tell the truth about how America got where it is. And especially, he said, the problem is linking the past to the present. Oh, you can talk about slavery as a skill set developer for black people, but you can't talk about the fact that it had an impact upon contemporary social struggle. So this is a predictable response. But the great prophetic mystic Howard Thurman said, never reduce your dreams to your present event. He said, you're going to either be a prisoner of an event or you're going to be a prisoner of hope. He said, I choose to be a prisoner of hope and I echo the great Howard Thurman. Michael Eric Dyson, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.